All right, so today we are going to um, open our Bibles and read from the book of Luke chapter 23. So let's go ahead and do that. Luke, the book of Luke, chapter 23, Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third gospel in the New Testament, second part of your Bible, chapter 23, and toward the end of the chapter there, we're going to start off in verse 26. Okay, so we're going to read it together, and we're going to go all the way through verse 43. And we're going to read it out loud together, and then I'm going to study it with you, okay? So let's all stand, and let's read the Bible together. And um, you're not in your bedroom just going, okay, and Jesus hung on the cross, and, you know, or whatever, you know, you're you're in church, and it's public reading, okay? So this is public reading. And public reading means that you're publicly reading. Okay, so here we go. Simplicity there. Okay, okay. So verse 26 Ready, begin. Now, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of the people followed him, and women who also mourned and lamented. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed, the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs, that never bore, and breasts which never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in the green wood, what will be done in the dry? There were also two others criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots, and the people stood looking on. But even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the chosen of God, verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him with letters in Greek, Latin and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, you can be seated. Now, I know we didn't get to the one about him being on the cross and saying, you know, John, behold your mother, and Mary, you know, woman, behold your son. Um, But that's in the book of John. We'll get to that today because it's the cross reference for this particular um, section of Scripture that a lot happened here. And each of the Gospels give you a part of, of what happened. So the message today is what Jesus was concerned about in the last hours. So what was he concerned about? And so we're going to take a look at that because he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, right? So he obviously was um, concerned about all of those who were taking part in his crucifixion, all of those that were, as he's being led to the cross, weeping for him, all of those that are standing around the cross, which were some of his disciples and those ladies, um, including his mother and his disciple John. All right. So the first person that we're going to look at, and it doesn't say that Jesus was thinking about him, but Jesus had to be thinking about him. Because there was a man named Simon the Cyrenian who just was not part of the multitudes. I mean, he was, but he wasn't. The multitudes were coming And they were following because Jesus was being crucified. But he was passing by. I I don't know if you've ever just ended up in something that you're like, whoa, what's what's all this crowd here? What's going on? And and then all of a sudden you're in something that you're in over your head. You didn't even know that you're going to be in this situation. And, And the Roman soldiers apprehend him and lay this cross beam 
upon him. I mean, never to think in a million years that that is what your day was going to bring forth. And, and we really have no idea, oftentimes, what we're going to bear. We have no idea what, you know, life is going to bring us. And, you know, we have these great ideas of, you know, you're young and marriage and family and, you know, and then someday maybe grandkids and, you know, life is going to be like this. And, and yet, throughout life, take up your cross and follow him. Like, what is that cross? And how do I take it up? Well, if you're following Christ, it just finds you. It just finds you. It's just, boom, it's on your shoulders. And, and then why me? Why Simon Cyrenian? Why did God choose me? And, and then was Simon chosen by God? I mean, it was the Roman soldiers that put it on him. It was just happenstance. But was it? Or was it God's plan? Because the scriptures teach that who he was the father of. And the only reason why that it would mention who's he the father of, because there's another biblical reference to one of those people. And so at least one of his sons, probably both of them, because they were known um, by those that would read, were, were part of the church. And so they were part of Christianity. So these, these guys, this guy who has this crossbeam, um, maybe somebody who's from, you know, this other country and coming to worship God, but not a believer yet. But it even talks about the wife of this guy. And so the wife was a believer, even if he never became a believer. And, but somewhere along the line, those Christian experiences affect you. I had a great grand, no, great grandfather? Yeah, great grandfather. <laughs> great grandfather who lived in Canada. And, uh, he was a businessman, and, uh, but he got saved in a tent revival and, and was healed, a miraculous healing. And there was a gospel tract that was written about his life that went to thousands or millions of people. I mean, it was like this, it was a well-known story of my, my great-grandfather. And um, so all over Canada. And so they were passing these out. You know, here's what happened to this man and his family got saved and, you know, this, this whole thing. Um, but... He had no idea that day that he stumbles into this place, you know, that this is going to be his life, and that all of a sudden he's going to, um, you know, be somebody that, that shares Jesus with people as a businessman. And, and you don't realize what the Lord's going to lay upon you. All of a sudden it's like businessman slash evangelist, you know. But God puts us in things sometimes through natural means. Roman soldier, what does that have to do with God? My boss, what does that have to do with God? And yet, all of a sudden, you're thrust into something that you're just going, was this inadvertent, or is this the will of God? Does God really work all things together according to the counsel of his will, and I just happen to be, like, this is now part of God's plan for my life, and this happened for a reason? So this guy, imagine that load. You're, you're carrying this crossbeam. What am I doing here? But, you know, you're not going to open your mouth because you know these guys then will just beat you or, or kill you or whatever. And it's like, and you're looking over at, at Jesus there, and the reason why he had to carry the crossbeam, because the soldiers could see that he was tired, that he was weary. The Bible talks about other times Jesus being tired and weary, just his human flesh, right? He could only take so much. And then somebody needed to come alongside. The person was forced, they were compelled, it wasn't voluntary. But you could imagine as Jesus is realizing this person is forced to help, but maybe a little head nod of approval, of appreciation. But Jesus is obviously thinking of him because this guy just took his load. And I will say that we as Christians, and, and, and like talking about moms, especially moms, I mean, you know, that video we watched, how much of a load do they take over the years, you know, the meals and the fevers, and the, the, the drives and the, you know, the, the list is endless of either the oppressiveness of it or the blessedness of it or the stress of it or the enjoyment of it, but it, it, it's, it's a load. And, and you didn't know when you were 18 years old and picturing a wedding someday that you'd have four kids or three kids or two kids and it would be like that, you know? And because and, life throws craziness at us, doesn't it? It does. And, and so this man, 
is in an unintentional situation, but I think all of us just kind of get broadsided. We all kind of get, you know, hit on the side of the head. It's like, where did that come from? Well, I guess that's the course of my life now. I mean, when I broke my leg, and I, I know the date, on September 27th, and then I had surgery in the middle of October, and I had swelling until March, you know, and I'm like trying to heal, and I have a plate that big with eight screws and another big screw and all this stuff. You're like, I didn't ask for that. That was inadvertent. But it's part of my life. And part of like, you know, when I, when I woke up after the first few days, and I would wake up, and i like, you know, because I'm a get-going kind of a person. And I go, oh, I guess I'm staying in bed. Do you know that that was like being in solitary confinement in prison? For me, oh, what a breaking that was. It's like, next day, oh, I guess I'm in bed. Like, I can't get out of bed. And, and, and now I think I understand things that I didn't understand before. After six weeks, eight weeks of that, you know. And yes, I did come here and teach you guys, but that's because they drove me. My leg was propped up. You saw me propped up here. Had to go home because of the swelling immediately afterwards. No fellowship from Pastor John and in bed for the rest of the day. Doctor in church was the only thing, except for that one target visit that I died for. <laughs> okay, and, and it, it, was, it was all fake. It was all fake, believe me, I have to explain it to you. But this man is sharing in the sufferings of Christ. He's not born again. He's not like following Jesus, but yet he is following Jesus. But he's fellowshipping, he's partaking, he's participating in the sufferings of Christ, and that is what we are all called to do as believers, is to take part in that part of a relationship with Christ. It's not all just fun and games. I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, I love Christian music, I love my Christian t-shirt, I love my Christian marriage, I love my Christian kids. It's, it's, it's no, no. It's like, okay, that's, that's, some, you know, frosting and all that kind of stuff, but partaking of the sufferings of Christ. That's, that's hard. And, and you're like, I became, I, yeah, I raised my hand. Yeah, I went forward. I didn't sign up for this, did I? I'm sorry. You did? You did. And so sometimes we will willingly lay down our life for somebody and we'll participate with them. Let me lay by you right now as you're suffering. You ever sit by somebody's hospital bed, but you would rather just be laying there next to them? You know, because really you're tired. And, you know, they're just watching them be wiped out is wiping you out. But, but we understand the idea of that, that fellowship with somebody. More than anything, a mom understands going through that with your husband and your kids. I mean, they lay down their lives. I mean, believe me, with Maureen being gone June 24th, you know what, month and so many days it will be a year, I mean, every time this or that comes up, I'm going, I was so oblivious, so oblivious. I had a, I had a couple of guys stay over at my house this week, um, pastor from another city, and then his friend that goes to Great Glory's church. And so there was some fellowship. And so I'm cooking breakfast, because I like cooking breakfast for people. And I'm like, okay, it's hot. And then this person's going out to his car and doing business calls. And the eggs are cold, the bacon's cold, you know, this, that's the whole thing. And, and I mean, yeah, you can put it in the microwave, but I mean, I'm like, I'm, you know, trying to make this all, like, presentation good, you know, like, I, I, I'm so on top of everything, I keep my house clean, I do church, I give you food, and, you know, everything's, you know, this, this guy's, you know, on top of the world, right? And, um, but I, I think of all the times, my wife would go, it's hot, and it tastes better hot, John, and I'd be I don't mind it cold. I, I just like food. And I, like, I wasn't like keying into how she felt and what she wanted to do for me because I, I was missing it. And, th and that's, that's, that's moms. I mean, they're, they're, they're thinking to the umph degree of how they can bless you and how they can come alongside of you and make your life better. But imagine being forced to make somebody else's life better. But some of you had a shotgun wedding and you had kids with somebody you didn't want to have kids with and when I say shotgun Wendy, because maybe you fell in love just one night and you went to Vegas and you're like, I just married a terrorist. 
or something. You know, whatever, you just, you're, you're going, what in the world was this? And, and so, yes, life can be hideous and horrible, right? But, you know, I don't want to say an old phrase. I want to make up a new phrase. If life gives you sour things, don't become a sourpuss. Okay, there we go, because you know what the other one is. Okay, so, taking part in the sufferings of another. Colossians 1.24 says, now I rejoice, and this is from the New International. Colossians 1.24, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. Was anything lacking in Christ's afflictions? As a Christian, you would say, if I stood up here this morning, I said something was lacking in the afflictions of Christ. Heresy, Pastor John, I'm going to go find another church. But I'm only quoting a Bible verse. Because there was nothing lacking in the afflictions of Christ for salvation of the church, but for the ongoing maintenance of the church and encouraging people in their weaknesses and in their affliction and persecutions and all that stuff, that, that the church would go through suffering. So, so there are, were people that had to suffer on behalf of the preaching of the word and for the propagation and promotion of the church. There were people that, so there was a continue, continued partaking of Christ's suffering that would go on that wasn't just the suffering on the cross for our sins, but it was his ongoing suffering for the sake of the body of Christ for the church. And, and so Paul mentioned that. And so you're doing something on behalf of another, and it was put on you, and it was put on Paul one day. I'm gonna show you how many things you must suffer, Jesus said to him. What if Jesus said that to you? I'm gonna show you how many things you must suffer for my sake. Whoa, I saw a gulping throat there. <laughs> okay, I get it. I know, now you're going, oh my gosh, pastor, these are gulping throats. <laughs> Okay, no, no, I'll, if it's a real convicting thing, I'll close my eyes. Okay, 2 Corinthians 1.5. It says, for just as we share abundantly in the suffering of Christ, we also, um, our comfort abounds through Christ. That's also New Living. I just, our New International, I wanted to share a different translation, but we share in his sufferings. That's, that's, it goes on and on. Many verses, I, I found it. And another one, which was interesting, it was 1 Corinthians 4, 12 and 13. And it said, um, after it talked about the, fiery trials that we go through. And it said, to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ. I, I was thinking, because you know, the Bible talks about like hell being degrees. Like, like meaning whatever that means for a soul, I don't know. Because I mean, obviously that one soul could talk while it was down there, right? And think and all that kind of stuff. So you are living when you're there. But, but um, you know, it says that it's gonna be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for this, the towns that rejected the preaching of the gospel. So obviously there's degrees because the Bible mentions several scriptures like that. And um, so it, it's interesting where it, it says there's a, a degree of suffering. So then some people do go through more suffering than others, don't they? And, and oftentimes moms, women, wives, you know, does your husband really love you? Do your kids really love you? Do you know the Bible doesn't really say a whole lot about that. It just says to the mom, it says, lo, it tells her specifically in Titus, love your husband and love your kids. That's what it says. It doesn't say, do, does your husband love you and do your kids love you, but you just got to love them. That's a hard job because you might not always get a thanks for that meal. You might not always get the big hug and the big kiss and all of the love in return for who you are and what you do. But, um, but you know what? God sees it, doesn't he? He sees it. And he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And also, um, Romans 8, 17, it says, Indeed, if we share in his sufferings, um, and then the Bible talks about those that overcame the devil because they loved not their lives even to death. Like meaning, I'm suffering for Christ, so I'm able to get through this, no matter what it is. And then one last one on the sufferings, of fellowshipping in somebody else's sufferings, specifically Christ. It says in Philippians 3, 10, it says, I want to know the participation of his sufferings. Now, that, for Paul, was one of the greatest things that he could attain to, to know him and the participation or the fellowship. Okay, the fellowship means participation. Participation in his sufferings, that I would know him and participate in Jesus' sufferings. You know, I've read that verse 
a gazillion times, and I've never gravitated toward the whole verse, only just that I may know him. But the fellowship of his sufferings, like, eh, I don't want that one. Um, you know, it's negative to us. But I, I think that we've got to just embrace where we're at. And as Simon the Cyrenian is now bearing the cross for Jesus, you can complain, you can be a hater, you can despise your life, or you can get through it. And you can live your life, and you can find something good in it, and you can know that God says there's something eternally good in this. And so, um, Mark 15, 21 says in the cross-reference about Simon, it says, then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by. He was just coming out of this area and he was passing by and to bear the cross of Jesus. And then later in Romans 16, 13, it says, greet Rufus, chosen of the Lord. Greet one of his sons. And, And I'm positive that that's why that's all put there, the name and everything, to show that he, his family became part of our family. And, and so, you know, when you ask somebody to do something for you, hey, can you come and help with our kids' event? I know you're not a Christian, but you know what? You don't have to be a Christian today <laughs> because we need help or, or whatever. You know, something comes up in a church. I had my son-in-law who was not following Christ, and I didn't have anybody to do worship at a funeral and he is a prolific musician. And in one half hour, he learned three Christian songs, wonderfully, worship songs, and did them like a professional. And like nobody at the funeral knew. <laughs> you know, so, so meaning that sometimes things get laid upon you, but God has a plan for it and a purpose for it in your heart. And in, in this guy, Simon the Serenian's heart. And, and Jesus said that if somebody compels you to go one mile then go with him too. Like, just be willing to not complain, but go, okay, well, is there anything else I can do for you? I mean, after you get to Golgotha, the place of the skull, and you're worn out, you're not gonna wanna do anything else. And I'll tell you, that's the way the church works. Well, you know, I taught Sunday school when I was in my 40s and 50s. I'm in my 70s or 80s now. I could never do that. My time for God is up, you know? It's like, I don't read anything about Christian retirement in the Bible. Do you know what I'm saying? We are servants of the living Christ. And, and whatever God calls you to do, do it with all your might, with no excuses, because you love God. And the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, he said, I will very gladly spend my own money and, and be spent for your souls. And, and he was talking to the Corinthians because he did. He spent his, whole, all, his own money and worked in order to do a mission trip for them. And so I'm willing to put into you, and and parents put into their families a lot of money over the years, a lot of money over the years. I mean, I just kind of finished paying a student, parent student loan. You know, I mean, that kind of stuff is like, uh, right? But I will very gladly, and I very gladly would spend and, and, and be spent for somebody's soul, for a family member to know Christ and grow up in a Christian home and follow the Lord. And so, so we all end up doing things that we don't want to do, that our boss made us do, that are, we're, we're forced into for our kids because they're on a sports team and now we got to go to all these games and you no longer have a life. Your life is baseball. Okay? Um, something your husband wants you to do, something your wife wants you to do. But I, I realized with my wife, honey, could you um, take these things there and could you do this and I mean, I, I just thought she was there for me, <laughs> you know? I mean, I knew I was there for her, but I just thought she was there for me. And, and, and then when you're doing all those things yourself, you're like, whoa. Like, you know, she was like, because somebody told me the other day, they, they said, you know, I was telling them about, you know, I'm doing a couple loads of laundry a week, and I'm washing bedding, my daughter stays the night one day a week, and, you know, all this stuff, and I'm doing this and that, and the, the, the dog, and, you know, I mean, the list goes on, right? And so he's going, how could there be that much? There's just one person. Just you. And then all of a sudden I realized, my poor wife. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, men just leave things around. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I leave it, I pick it up, leave it, pick it up. I'm going, I am such a, a, a problem here. And, um, 
So I can hardly wait till I can get to heaven. Okay, so, but you're sharing in the life of another person. And so you're very close to them at that time, close in proximity in carrying their cross, going with them through one of the hardest times of their life. But what if that person is a stranger? But we were strangers when we, when we were yet strangers, sinners to Christ, hostile to Christ. He took our burden upon himself and died for us. And we gotta always remember that. God can bring along somebody right now that can lift your load. Don't take advantage of other people. Don't necessarily force it on other people. There's nothing wrong with asking somebody. There is also times to learn how to do things yourself. But what a blessing when somebody just, hey, I'll pay for that. Hey, I'll give you this. Hey, I'll help in this way. You know, there's a story in the book of Philemon, two guys there, master, a slave, slave ran away, becomes Paul's helper. Paul felt like, I better give him back to his master because, you know, this is like stealing because he's a runaway slave, but he masters a born-again Christian. He says, I know that he's yours, and, you know, but tell you what, um, he's useful to me. He's useful to you as a brother now, too. And um, so, but if you want to, have him come and do the work of the ministry, it'd be nice if you kind of let him come my way. And it says in one verse in the book of Philemon, for perhaps, in verse 15, uh, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that he might, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And so somebody becomes a brother, the person who you came alongside of, the person that you bore their burden, the person that you loved on, that person becomes a refresher of you, a blesser of you, a come alongsider of you, a Holy Spirit filled person in your life. And so for moms that have lifted the load, you know, there is a payback. And it's not just in eternity. There is a payback. There is a time where the kids buy you dinner. There is a time where all of a sudden, you don't have all your retirement ready. Dad is dead, and they're taking you in their house. And, and there's some great scriptures like that, and one of them says to remember, remember your mother when she is old. Don't forget her when she is old, um, from, from the book of Psalms or Proverbs. Um, but this man didn't choose Jesus, but Jesus obviously chose him. He had an ultimate plan for his life. And... He wasn't anybody that he was supposed to be, but he was becoming who God had for him to become as he's carrying that load. And a lot of times, those loads that we carry are developing us. They're developing deeper character within us because we didn't ask for it, but we got it. And then um, the rest of the scriptures, I'm gonna get to the, the, the closing scripture because um, I'm gonna... I realize I'm gonna have an easier time next week because I'm gonna save the rest of the chapter that we read for, for next week. But basically, the cross-reference of the same section of scripture that we read, um, and so the, the whole thing that, that happened is he gets to the cross, multitude follows him, um, he has the thieves on both sides. We'll get to the thieves on both sides next week. And Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. But also, while he's up there and he's talking um, here's one of the things that he, that he says in, um, if you get to the book of John, go ahead and turn there. And it's in John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Now, my message is, what's he thinking at the end? And he speaks to the daughters of Jerusalem that it's, it's okay to have a barren womb. There's a time where it's a blessing to not be a mother, Jesus said. There's a time where it could be a blessing not to be a mother. That's for you ladies next week that need to hear that. But in John chapter 19, verse 25, it says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother, the disciple whom he loved standing by, um, and the disciple whom, whom he loved, he said to his mother, woman, 
behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Now I was figuring this out, and in my estimation, if she was 16, some people think 14 to 16, you know, people even, even in other countries today, but th that would have been a typical marrying age for girls and, and you know, and, and so even earlier in, in this country too. But you've got um, this, this young woman and Jesus dying on the cross, so I'm figuring she's only like 49 years old. Okay, I'm older than that. And so, I want you, John, to know this is your mom. I've got sisters and brothers, but I'm the oldest son, and I'm appointing you because my sisters and brothers are not the kind of person that I want my mom living with. I want you, John, because you, you're the most loving guy in the world. Mom's gonna stay with you. And, and from that very day, he took her to his home. On that cross, he's thinking not just the criminals and the soldiers and the sneerers, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Mom's standing right there with her sister and cousin and this and that, and, and she's standing right there, and I'm like, you're gonna go stay with John. You're gonna go stay with John. Are you thinking like that? Are you so caught up in your own trial and your own sufferings or bearing somebody else's sufferings that you're missing something so important. Jesus didn't miss his mom when he was on the cross. He didn't miss the mark. You're not on a cross. You're not suffering bloodshed. You might be going through hard things, but nothing like that. You call your mom today. Go put her in your best friend's house. Unless your best friend's a drug addict. <laughs> and, um, you know, just bless mom. And those of you that have bad relationships with your mom, figure it out. You're a Christian. You're grown up. You're not a kid anymore. You know, people who blame their moms and their dads, like, oh, they raised me this way. And, you know, they're in their 50s and 60s and saying that. What is wrong with you? You got stuck at 20. You know? Grow up. You know, you raise a kid in the ways of the Lord, they will not depart. Maybe you need to raise your parent in the ways of the Lord now, and you need to grow up and then bring them to Christ.